Hello, beautiful nerds. My name is Monty Paulson. I lead the PassFast team at RDH Building Science here in Canada. And it is my privilege to welcome you to the Global Passive House Happy Hour this afternoon, hosted by Passive House Accelerator. This is an inclusive gathering. We welcome people from all Passive House communities. We welcome people from all backgrounds, from all countries, working on all types of Passive House, as well as working on embodied carbon, electrification, climate adaptation, indoor air quality, and the task of retrofitting billions of buildings in our lifetimes. So please turn on your cameras. We want to see you. Even you, Sean, please turn on your microphones. We want to make some noise together in a moment. Tonight, I would like you to join me and raise a glass, whatever you got, to Oakland, San Jose, and 40 other cities in California that have now passed restrictions on installing fossil fuel gas in new buildings. What? So oh, here, 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 here. 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 here, Thank you, Monty. Add Seattle to that list. Nice. Yeah. Hey. That's 40 just in California. You're right. There are something, there are more across yeah. the country. Yeah, it's an Amazing. astonishing step forward. And it's a slippery slope, right? Because once you start taking the gas out, you lose the high BTU heating, a better enclosure starts to make a lot more sense. So close your mic, stick around. We have a great show, including the man behind the curtain at Vancouver City Hall, Chris Higgins. Now over to you, Prudence. All right. Thanks, Monty. I'm uh, Prudence Ferreira. I'm the Passive House Practice Lead for Morrison Hirschfield, joining you all tonight from Philadelphia, at least for one more week. Surprise. Next week, I'm moving to Boston. <laughs> and uh, I'm taking a new position to help move large scale passive house and carbon neutral buildings forward in that market and beyond. Today, I'm especially happy because here in Philly, it snowed for the first time this fall. Just flurries. But having lived in a zero energy passive house in Fairbanks, Alaska for seven years, I have a special love of the winter because there's <clears throat> nothing better than putting on a pair of running shoes upgraded with sheet metal screws in the treads sealed with a bit of epoxy, going out for a sub-zero run where you better keep running fast or you freeze, and then coming home to a cozy passive house, letting the ice crystals in your eyelashes melt as you relax in total comfort. So in tonight's video, we get to go to the snowy north for a guided tour by Sean St. Amour from the exterior of two passive houses in Fort St. John, BC, a multifamily and a single family. The six story 50 unit multifamily was completed in early 2019 and achieved the PHI passive house standard certification. And the city of Fort John also owns a 37 hectare inner city site allocated for implementation of sustainable neighborhood and the single family project is the pilot project, the demonstration project for that neighborhood and is FIAS and LEED Platinum certified. Also the first passive house detached residence in BC. So let's have a look. Hey everybody, I'm in Fort St. John. Let's go check out a multifamily passive house and a single family, let's go. Hey everybody, I'm at the Fort St. John multifamily passive house. This is the south facing. And again, it's winter time, so again, look at this low profile sun here. So, trying to get as much sunlight into this high performance building. And let's go check out some of the details. All right, so here's the east and south facing. So, lots of windows, high performance windows from Duxton out of Manitoba. So, Canadian made high performance windows. Lots of light coming in. And you can see the Swagon uh, ERV uh, hiding up there at the top. All right, here's the uh, west face and so again you've got these solar deflectors because you want to stop the sunlight that would be coming in from the north face during the summertime something you wouldn't experience in uh, lower part of north america but up here in the north you get it and the uh, hrv pipes and you can see they got a little bit of northern weather up here here you can see the thickness of the wall two by six construction exterior rock wool with uh, Sega products to make it airtight. Um, again, uh, fiberglass windows. You can see the detail all the way up the building. Very nice. Here's North Face, and not a lot of windows. Here you go, the uh, ERV is in operation on a cold November day. All right, there's that building again. Just wanted to show you. Swagon unit on the rooftop. 
Here is one of the first passive houses, single family homes built in Canada. First one in BC. Let's go check out the five passive house principles. Beautiful door from Euroline. Windows up here from Cascadia window. Thick walls that were pre-made from BC Passive House. Got a lot of prefab. Here's the south facing. There's solar panels that are hiding under the snow. Lots of windows to brighten up and warm up the home. Certified passive house with Fias. And on the final blower door test, I got 0.33 ACH. All right, one last view of the building. Forgot a couple details. 1900 square foot building. Passive house consultant was Alex of Markin Projects. Highly recommend you check out the video of Paul and Catherine that can show you all the beautiful interior finishes and details. Check it out. Bye. All right, everyone, that was uh, so good that we decided to show it again. Um, yeah, so moving right along, we're going to go into uh, the, the breakout rooms. And uh, again, we have, you can uh, ch chuckle with each other if you like. Um, the, uh, we're going to do five minutes. So that five minutes goes fast. So please uh, make sure you get around and do some rapid fire introductions. And we'll talk to you shortly. Thanks, everybody. Um, so on the Passive House Accelerator website, every week we, pr we produce a Passive House Week in Preview um, article. So you can find all of the links I'm going to be sharing um, there. Uh, we just, so tonight's um, uh, happy hour is celebrating the Passive House Canada Summit. And we're aligning everything that we're talking about with that summit. And um, that's actually happening, it has been happening all week. On Monday, we, we released our Passive House podcast episode with Killian Collins of Perkins and Will. And he, Killian talks about the amazing solo project that we really need to get on onto the happy hour, as well as another Mass Timber project, a, a big student housing project, um, and, and talks about the summit. So please, please uh, check that out. There's information about the summit itself. Next week, uh, we on Monday, we have the Passive House Prefab Summit number two. Um, the first one was uh, filled to capacity. We've expanded our capacity, so uh, you can be sure to actually get into the room this time. And uh, it's a whole new slate of, of manufacturers, new presenters, and also moderated by Sean St. Amour and produced by uh, Mary James of Passive House accelerator and the uh, the actually we have joint sponsors for the for the um, summit vapro shield and rdh building science all sorts of socials going on um, including the building conversations with chris ballard that'll happen next wednesday so you want to check that out and it's uh, happens um, every few weeks and then a bunch of great educational content on tap so with that i'm going to hand it off to monty Thank you, Zach. What an amazing amount of stuff. The Passive House Summit's great. It's really amazing for some of us who uh, first had the vague idea for Passive House Canada sitting around uh, Guido Vimmer's uh, little tiny cramped in office in a cheesy room down by the river and what Rob Bernhardt and others have built it into is truly amazing. All right, so let me start with this. I pay taxes in the city of Vancouver. And so I wanna tell you about our next speaker. Chris Higgins has worked at several of the most uh, kind of signature companies in Canada, Mountain Equipment Co-op, the Canadian Green Building Council, where he was instrumental in the Lead for Homes program. And he's now part of the sustainability team at the city of Vancouver. Chris came from the second harshest part of Canada, a place called Newfoundland. And he's one of the hardest working people I knew. It's amazing how often if you stop by Chris's house, he's like standing half in his waist up to a ditch digging gravel or something like that. Chris is the kind of guy you invite him to come stay at your cabin for a weekend and he literally sort of nonchalantly splits a quart of wood while he's there visiting. But what really makes Chris amazing is this. <clears throat> City of Vancouver has been going through this process for several years now of updating incrementally its building code and as the building code comes up the window code comes up. But builders, some house builders, have this weird forgetful memory. When it comes time to buy windows, they seem to forget that there's a new code and they buy windows that are like two or three codes ago just because they're cheaper. And it puts the city in a really tough spot. The windows are in the building, they're installed, the house is ready for occupancy, there's an awful lot of pressure. Chris Higgins, the guy you're about to meet, is the only person I know who has actually forced builders to rip out completely finished installed windows that did not meet code 
and force them to actually put in windows that met code. And for that reason alone, not to mention the court of wood, uh, it is my deep honor to introduce you to my friend and hero, Chris Higgins. Thank you very much, Monty. That was a wonderful introduction. I hope to oh, I hope to live up to to that introduction someday. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to join you here from the city of Vancouver and tell you a little story about our our, our city. Uh, we're about 600,000 people um, in a metro area of about two and a half million people. And I'll uh, I'll pull up a slide so you can look at my slides. <coughs> uh, but we're in a the metro area of about two and a half million, so we're not particularly huge. We're not particularly huge by city standards. Uh, we're the third largest uh, city in Canada. I assume, Zach, everyone can see the slides now. Um, yep, you're all good. Wonderful. Uh, I've been a civil servant for about seven years. So I've worked with the city of Vancouver. It'll be seven years this, this April. Um, and one of the goals that we have as a city, that we've set it as a city, is to make building Passive House as easy and as profitable as it is to build the code minimum. So that guides a lot of our work. There was a dialogue in the breakout group that I was part of around like, how do you get people to build Passive House? Well, um, really quickly, and I'll, I'll touch on this in my presentation, but you, you remove barriers in a city, you remove barriers to building Passive House, and then you put in place incentives that put that project in a similar place uh, when you include risk in a similar place financially that they would have been if they just built uh, the worst building they could legally build, aka code minimum. Uh, so that's one of the uh, one of the kind of guiding pieces for the city of Vancouver. And thankfully, we don't have to do it alone. I, I noticed a number of other names here from Vancouver, including Leighton Williams, um, certified he's certified passive house trades person, and he heads our inspections group. And he has a couple of inspectors um, under his his management. Uh, that will go out to any passive house project. So you, you get a passive house trained inspector when you're working on a passive house project. So it reduces time. The goal is to reduce time for projects uh, and not to put up other barriers. I also saw uh, Scott uh, Kennedy, Ian, Roberto, obviously Monty, Melvin, uh, Killian, and, and Stuart. So there's a, a good few other practitioners. So while I present today as an individual, I really want to highlight that uh, that it's really is a team effort. There's many people here at the city um, that are uh, that are working on this effort uh, alongside me, and there's many people in, in the industry that make it possible. And the last piece before I jump into my formal presentation is it's important to, to kind of gauge success. If we look in the North American context, I believe the most successful energy focused standard is the Energy Star standard. And the um, largest sort of market penetration I saw in, in the US and in Canada was around 15%. So sometimes we debate, you know, does every house, does every building have to be passive house? And in Vancouver, we've taken the approach of encouraging passive house and rewarding passive house, but also bringing up the energy standard. Um, so all buildings achieve a significant greenhouse gas reduction. And we take what we've learned in through passive house and in passive house and I try to apply it to all buildings. So with that, I'll jump into my slide presentation. I talked a little bit about uh, the city and, and our size. So very comparable to a number of other uh, municipalities. Uh, so we're not particularly large. You don't have to be a big city to do this. And you don't have to have decades and decades of experience. Um, when I joined the city in 2014, um, the city had not been able to make significant greenhouse reductions outside of single family homes. Uh, we're actually seeing increasing greenhouse gases uh, from uh, commercial buildings. So it, it's not like we had a huge head start. So if you're in a city and you're like, wow, we're nowhere near there, you, you, you can get there in a few years with a few steps, which I'll, which I'll touch on. So one of the first things we did is we looked at where does our carbon pollution come from? Well, 54% of it comes from natural gas use uh, for buildings and heating and providing hot water in buildings. Vancouver is a, is a heating dominated climate. So we have some air conditioning, but not everyone has air conditioning and not everyone needs air conditioning. Uh, but heating really drives our, um, our greenhouse gas profile as a city. It even uh, goes uh, over and above uh, gasoline and diesel um, for transportation. So that's one of the reasons why Passive House is kind of an ideal standard uh, because it focuses on envelope reductions and we're also a jurisdiction that has uh, electricity that's about nine to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. 
and we have a natural gas that is two to three cents a kilowatt hour equivalent. So if you're going to transition off of a fossil fuel like natural gas to electricity, which in British Columbia is 98% hydro, you need to greatly reduce the amount of energy. So where have we, where have we gone over the last uh, little over 10 years in terms of carbon reductions? Well, we've gone from um, in 2007 to 2019, we've seen about a 9% reduction and the 2020 number looks about 10%. We need to get to 50%. So what Vancouver did uh, in 2019 is we declared a climate emergency. So we declared a climate emergency. There's six big moves. I won't go into them tonight. Uh, that So big move one is walkable, complete neighborhoods. Uh, big move two is active transportation and transit. Big move three is zero emissions vehicles. Big move four is zero emissions space and water heating, which I'll touch on tonight. Big move five is low carbon materials, so embodied carbon and six is around restoration and coastal uh, forests. So we'll only really touch on, on Big Move 4 and how Passive House is helping us to achieve uh, Big Move 4. But if you're interested in the climate emergency and all those moves, you can Google Climate Emergency Vancouver and, and see our, our response there. All right, there we go. Uh, so Big Move 4, zero emissions space and water heating. Uh, Passive House has really helped us to build industry capacity around high performance buildings. If you look in some under other sectors like the auto sector, I mean, they have F1, they have racing to kind of develop, develop their product supply and innovation. And in Vancouver, we have Passive House. So Passive House has really helped to rapidly develop our industry from uh, producing a lot of very modestly performing products to producing a, a full range of high performance products ready for the next code cycle. Uh, with Passivos, we're able to support early owner action. So I'll talk about some of the incentives that we've put in place and some of the barriers removed a little bit later. Uh, but it's really allowed us to advance our code quicker by demonstrating what's possible um, with, with uh, Passivos. If you want to learn a little bit more, uh, I'd suggest Googling the Zero Emissions Building Plan plus Vancouver, and you can view our plan, which highlights uh, how we're working to encourage Passive House and make Passive House sort of the first choice that builders and developers look to and at least consider. So before I go into some of the steps that we've taken as a city to make building Passive House easier, I thought I'd do a little bit of a retrospective. Where were we? Where are we? If we go back uh, to 2014, we had one single passive house under construction, and uh, this wasn't it, but this is a passive house under construction in Vancouver. The, the single passive house under construction at the time, if you talk to the person that built it, he will only have swear words about his uh, dialogue with the, the city of Vancouver, and that was sort of the, the, the starting point um, in 2014. Now, if we jump to 2020, we've got 364 uh, of passive dwellings either under construction or completed. And we've got 4,713 that are in for permit or inquiry, including this high rise, which recently cleared uh, the its rezoning uh, stage of, uh, of of permit review. So it's advancing significantly through the process, which is pretty exciting for us because obviously a large building uh, brings a lot of innovation and brings a lot of uh, global in interest uh, and su supply chain improvements. I talk a bit about supply chain improvements because if you don't have the products available, it's just that much more expensive. In 2014, uh, there was uh, zero uh, passive house window manufacturers that were producing uh, products locally from local extrusions. Um, there was one company that was importing. Uh, now in uh, 2020, we have six passive house window manufacturers uh, producing uh, products locally in wood, in vinyl, in aluminum, uh, and fiberglass. So there's a variety of products available locally, as well as products that can be brought from abroad. One of the things that's been really helpful as a staff is having companies that talk uh, to council when I'm presenting and, and bringing forward changes in policy or code to talk about how the high performance, the shift to high performance has been a business opportunity for them. So there's a local window manufacturer and they spoke to council recently and said they've recently doubled their factory size and 60% of their product is being exported. Um, so it's really great to have those local success stories because some councillors are on board with green buildings. All councillors, in my experience, are on board with growing the green economy. 
So one of the things that we did with uh, Passbus was point to it. So, so we set a clear destination and path by saying like, here's, here's the point that we're heading towards. We're heading towards Passive House. And why we're going there? Well, the envelope and ventilation systems, those, those should be considered first. And Passive House does that. And taking a page from Passive House in our building code, we're stepping down the greenhouse gas, um, the amount of greenhouse gases allowed and heat loss limits um, within our building code. It was really helpful as a city to learn that. Um, from Passive House. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of research that goes into Passive House and anyone that's been involved in the development of a standard know it takes a long, a long time. And being able to point to a standard like Passive House off the shelf is tremendously helpful. Uh, also having the training off the shelf. So being able to have trades training, being able to have a training for certified Passive House consultants or designers has been incredibly helpful. Um, these are two passive projects, the two towers pursuing passive house in downtown Vancouver. One of the things some people ask, well, what can I, what can we do first? What can we do in our city? One of the things is really to communicate with industry and have a dialogue between industry and, and the city. Uh, one of the things Vancouver did is um, in the basement of city hall after hours, after city hall was closed, we paid for a little bit of pizza and some pop and uh, Monty kindly organized uh, these events where this small growing community of practitioners that grew and grew and grew could meet and talk about Passive House. And it was really interesting. It was a safe space to talk about Passive House and with not uh, not worrying about uh, a competition as much, but you definitely did see, oh, uh, you know, developer XYZ or consultant ABC sent, sent two people this time. Oh, maybe I should communicate back to our office that we should send a couple people. Oh, there's a new project that's, that, that's coming out. It, it became this sort of hub that built a community that helped greatly accelerate uh, the transition off fossil fuels broadly in Vancouver and the growth of Passive House. Um, providing a certified Passive House trades education through the local trade school is also uh, key. We provide a 50% subsidy if you're a Vancouver-based business, or you do uh, you do work in Vancouver, and you're able to demonstrate that. Uh, we try to find uh, leaders and, and develop collaborations with leaders. We found that in our local market, uh, when you talk to architects and you talk to developers, many of them want to do better buildings. They just there's barriers to that. There's additional risk, and you need to try and help them de-risk the the, the projects. Uh, part of that can be uh, floor space incentives uh, help hugely, uh, but also removing barriers to uh, to building a passive house. We also try to feed uh, leaders. So we have a nearzero.ca has been a, a case study program for low rise residential. We provide $20,000 in exchange for case study information. And it's a way to provide an incentive early um, for smaller projects and try to encourage a wider number of projects to try Passive House. It's been very successful. Um, and I would say it's now uh, we're migrating to uh, a floor space uh, incentive. So we have a 5% floor space incentive for multifamily buildings. So if you're building a building with five dwellings or greater, you can access a 5% floor space incentive. And that's 5% on top of some other relaxations. Uh, we also have a 15 and an 18% incentive for single family and duplexes if you're pursuing passive house. There are no other relaxations um, or incentives for single family or, or duplex. So the 15 to 18% is more like a three to 4% incentive um, once you consider all of the other um, relaxations or easements that a multifamily project might get. And certainly last but not least in terms of what we're trying to do to feed leaders is someone will help you. So often there's sort of this adversarial relationship between the developer or um, a, a builder in, in city hall uh, and neither kind of want to show their cards. And there's an opportunity where if a project's having a problem early on, especially, they can reach out to a staff person like myself and I could try to problem solve, whether that means trying to get them their occupancy a few days before Christmas and going and sitting in a friendly way with um, the person that reviews uh, the occupancy permits and make sure all of the, the holds have been released and try to get them to release the occupancy that day, or whether it's uh, trying to uh, work out um, an agreement with BC Hydro or electrical utility um, <clears throat> to allow uh, construction within a certain uh, distance of a, a, of a high voltage feed that has historically been allowed. There's just, it's helpful to have someone on the inside troubleshooting. 
We've also worked to remove barriers. So a big piece is just the city getting out of the way. Uh, so we've relaxed some floor space, some height and some setback limits. There's still more work to do there. Um, we've also provided some flexibility on the frontage and shape and balcony requirements. If you look in the middle of the screen, there's areas that we require T-shaped buildings in Vancouver. Um, and we allow them to be a rectangle or a square if you're a passive house. So just some kind of relaxations and easements. At the same way, we may prescriptively on the right-hand side of the screen require balconies. For a passive house, we may allow you to accomplish that with a rooftop balcony if that's um, desired. Uh, we also try to inform our own staff. So I mentioned um, we're very lucky to have um, Leighton Williams heading the inspections team as a certified um, passive house tradesperson. And uh, we've also done presentations. I've done presentations to 10 to 15 uh, different city groups and uh, helped them if they wish to take uh, one day passive house training or even a number of them have taken the five day uh, and written the exam um, to get a certification. Because it's it's helpful when you talk to somebody at the city and you say we're building a passive house and they know what you're talking about. We're still working and there's always people leave and change jobs so it's kind of a continual process and we're not quite quite where we'd like to get to yet um, but we're definitely on the way uh, to the point of having city staff trained for every passive house project. Uh, building our own government capacity. So uh, all new civic facilities are gonna be built to passive house. And uh, we've trained over hundred city staff as well as uh, trades inspectors. This is our new fire hall 17. This is what it looked like in the summer. Um, it's coming together, got some local Cascadia windows, some Roxel insulation below there. Uh, it's pursuing passive house. Uh, these are, this is two uh, daycares on top of an existing parking garage. Um, one of the things that I've noted on this slide is when we put Passive House as a choice for projects that go through rezoning. So in Vancouver, most projects taller than six stories go through a rezoning process to add height, to add density. We put Passive House as the first, the number one choice, just so everyone would have to read it. Because if you read it, <laughs> The, 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 you're, you're absorbing at least some of it. You may not want to do it, but you're like, oh, wow, okay, this is something someone does. And not, I'm not saying that one thing alone has resulted in 20% of projects pursuing Passive House, uh, but it certainly helps uh, because, uh, because everyone has to look at it, everyone has to understand it. And it, it, it just, if you're, if you're considering a first step, if you have any requirements for buildings, considering allowing Passive House as an option, because you will see some leaders that will, that will choose that path. Some examples, this is a piece of art, should I be worried, sort of climate change focused uh, in Vancouver. The, uh, this is a project that didn't hit Passive House, it missed Passive House certification. The last I saw it was 127 kilowatt hours per meter squared and 0 0.72 ACH. It's still a great all electric building. Um, it's a six story rental, a project that targeted Passive House. This is the first certified Passive House in Vancouver, single family home. This is the first developer doing a second passive house. I think it's 100 passive homes um, in a mix of townhouses and apartments. Um, I believe it's all rental. This is a passive house high rise in downtown Vancouver, 485 homes, last I checked. Uh, this is our new school, very exciting, very rare um, in Vancouver, a group called Vancouver School Board get to build the schools usually, but this one is being built by Vancouver. So we get to make our own decisions and we've chosen to build it to passive house. Uh, there's also going to be a daycare and I think 60 odd or 70 odd uh, dwellings as well, um, mostly affordable housing. So when I started, I talked about Vancouver and how over, over a little over 10 years, we'd only reduced by about 9 to 10%. Uh, if we switch that from percentage to look at how we'll achieve uh, the 1.5 Celsius warm warming by 2030 uh, with the Climate Emergency Action Plan, SEEP, uh, we'll actually come very close to hitting that target. And if you include some money and incentives that are available from the province, we anticipating slightly exceeding, uh, slightly being under 1.5 Celsius uh, by 2030 with these new array, array of actions, including uh, accelerating high performance buildings using Passive House. And I would encourage any city that's considering uh, a transformation or an improvement of their building stock to really look to Passive House. Every building doesn't have to be Passive House but all of your buildings will be better for referencing Passive House. If you have questions, here are some emails. Um, so again, we work as a team. Um, I told Leighton I wouldn't give out his email, so I haven't. Uh, but if you want to talk to anyone about education, you can email Andrea Wickham at vancouver.ca. Zoning bonus density, talk to Charlene Black at vancouver.ca. He developed it. Myself, Chris Higgins at vancouver.ca. 
or get to me on Twitter, which I check in the evenings. So uh, you have a better chance of a speedy reply. I maybe just end with a quote, because uh, sometimes people say, well, Vancouver is so small. The quote that I like is from Milton Friedman. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, he was from the US. And he says, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That I believe is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Thanks very much for your time. I'm happy to take questions. I've got them lined up, Chris. Um, I'm just gonna dump the queue. Uh, Tommy, who is in Charleston has the first question. And if you missed it in the pre-show, the uh, James Brown blow door video was from that state. So Tommy, good good way to kick it off. I'm, I'm not sure, did I have a question? Uh, you did, but if you don't want to ask it, we can move along. All good. I, I think I just forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Tommy. I'll, 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 I'll send it to you in G. Um, then we're over to, oops, over to Graham. So I just put a list in the, in the chat. Graham, do you recall yours? I do. Uh, first of all, Chris, thank you for that inspiring presentation. If you want to come straighten out San Francisco anytime, let me know what I can do to help. But my question, my question was, um, did, does the city of Vancouver have energy modeling requirements as a manner of course already? And that, I guess I'm asking that in the context of uptake from somewhere, you know, if there were no requirement to moving to passive house because it's so central to passive house. But um, yeah, I guess, do they and what is the, the nature of it and not in great detail? Yeah, great, great question. So yeah, in brief, yes, we do have energy modeling requirements. And sometimes the second question is, do you accept passive house in lieu of? And yes, we do. We don't make people do two energy models. Um, so we do have energy requirements and we do accept PHPP as a, an energy model um, from passive house projects, projects pursuing passive house. Um, and I would say energy modeling is um, widely used, certainly for everything from a single family house or a lane house, which is about 900 square feet, all the way up to large commercial buildings, we do require energy modeling and energy modeling is done on most projects. Um, there are some commercial buildings that can do uh, ASHRAE's uh, sort of trade-off. Uh, uh, there's a, 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 few, a few different approaches that uh, some ASHRAE projects allow, but yes, energy modeling is, is, is required. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Great. Excellent, and Harvey, you had about three questions, so pick which one. Sounds like now that you're an educated tradesperson, you've got lots of Passive House questions. No, Peter no, Beaver. actually, thank you. No, the two of them, the last two we answered, which were uh, um, height uh, and other setbacks, and uh, uh, and I um, and I think it was about you know about third floors and, and, and everything else of that effect. But my my other question was, how has this worked with you for liaisoning with province, other provinces, federal government? Is anybody contacted you because? You know, I'm in Toronto. I, you know, we're we're doing something, but not enough. And and what you're doing is a lot. And I think it could be a leader. And I'm just wondering, is anybody looking at Vancouver and and from other provinces and and trying to say, let's mimic you? What can we do? How do we get involved? How do we get the uh, uh, the federal government involved, etc. And great presentation, great. by the way. Very well done. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, great question. So the short answer is yes. Uh, some jurisdictions uh, in BC have modeled or borrowed um, our policy and rolled it out. So allowing passive house incentives and floor area bonuses and those kind of pieces. We have had some discussions. I pre-pandemic, going back to last January, I traveled to the city of Winnipeg and talked to some uh, uh, city staff there, as well as uh, some of the, the building and development industry. Um, we have had uh, some calls with Natural Resources Canada and CMHC, uh, and we have had a few emails back and forth with um, uh, the City of Toronto, and we're happy to happy to do more. I would say the dialogue with the City of Toronto and Intercan was a few years ago. Um, I, I'm optimistic in terms of the impact that, that could be had, and we could share, certainly share some of our policy with the City of Toronto. 
the I think Intercan they have standards that they develop and they they like their their own standards. So I'd be less optimistic and with making a lot of headway there. But with um, with Toronto or, or other cities, uh, for sure. And we're definitely ha happy to share our our experience and our policy because while cities might have slightly different approaches, uh, I think there are some universal truths that as buildings get um, have thicker walls, there's going to need to be some sort of incentive or relaxation or easement that encourages builders and developers to take that additional risk. Um, so in short, Harvey, I'm happy to, uh, to talk with someone in the city of Toronto if you let me know who the right person is. I'm also happy to connect the right person, like if the head of inspections from the city of Toronto wants to talk to the head of inspections from Vancouver or a counselor from Toronto wants to talk to a counselor in Vancouver, I'm happy to make those connections. Well, I'll, I'll see what I do. I'm pretty close with one of the counselors here, and I'm going to probably be seeing him this week. Um, just quickly, just as an aside, I, I'm originally from Winnipeg. So how did that go, and what were the changes that uh, they're looking to do for, are they looking at 24 inches of insulation on the outside of the house <laughs> because it's so cold there? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is there were a number of local developers and product supply companies like Duxton, who were mentioned earlier, that were really keen to see the city embrace some changes. Uh, I would say the city took away what I what I brought and are, are considering or thinking about it, but I didn't see any sort of immediate action, um, which was what the, uh, I'm also met with the province, um, um, uh, Manitoba. Uh, I met with the province and gave a presentation there. And so I didn't see any specific actions uh, that came away from, from that, uh, which is what the builders and developers who brought me there were really hoping for. Um, so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, and if, if I can just jump in and add, I've had conversations in the last month with uh, the managers of building inspections from Regina and Winnipeg and, um, it's been a broader conversation than just how we deal with energy and passive houses. They've also had questions about enforcement and, you know, just sharing best, best practices. But a, a big chunk of that was about energy and passive house. So small steps. Nice. Thanks, Leighton. For those that don't know Leighton, he is happy to join us on the Happy Hour. Um, and typically we pull him into the after hour for a whole bunch of deep questions because he's managing the inspectors here in Vancouver. So, um, and they've got uh, about 75% of the inspectors are passive house certified tradespeople. So pretty phenomenal, the level of what's happening in the city of Vancouver. So thanks Leighton. Um, and if you missed it last night, I owed Leighton some tape. Okay, moving along, John, Bokla, where are you? You wanna talk about embodied carbon? Yeah, hey everybody, thanks Chris, uh, that was great. Um, just wondering if you could speak to the embodied carbon strategy you guys are uh, planning and strategizing, if you could talk uh, and specifically if it's gonna affect uh, high rise concrete and developers uh, perspective on that. For sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about embodied carbon. So the area that I focus on as a employee of the city is low rise residential. So that's the area where I can speak the most. So maybe I'll speak about that first and then I'll just touch on the high rise um, and commercial piece briefly. Uh, so we're, we're planning for 2021 uh, to launch a case study program around embodied carbon, which will use a calculator developed by builders for climate change. You can Google it and, and see what they're all about. Uh, that's been used elsewhere in Canada to provide an incentive for builders of low rise residential to use the calculator and reduce the embodied uh, emissions uh, that, that uh, sit within the low rise residential uh, construction uh, type. So the houses that they're building essentially build lower carbon houses. And when we look at uh, high rises, uh, the approach is materials agnostic. So the modeling and the, the software will have carbon intensities associated with different materials. And we're looking at what we've published, uh, I would need to, Check. I believe it's a 40% reduction in embodied carbon is our is our goal. Um, so that a project could material switch. Um, they could also use um, different supplementary cementitious materials or different add mixes um, to reduce the carbon intensity of concrete. Does that answer your question, John? Yep, for sure. What, one more thing is, what would um, if, if you mentioned incentives? What what would the incentives specifically look like? 
Sure, yeah. Um, so for low rise residential, um, the space that I work in, the dollar value isn't uh, set, but uh, elsewhere in Canada, there was about a 10 to $12,000 incentive for projects that use this embodied carbon calculator and reduced the embodied carbon in the project, sometime, somewhere between 20 and 45% um, for low rise uh, single family homes. So we'd probably see something similar, um, you know, something in that sort of 10 to $20,000 range um, in terms of the incentive that would be offered. And we're hoping to also offer a higher incentive for uh, projects that seek to be carbon neutral in construction, not through offsets, but through using materials that have absorbed carbon throughout their, their sort of growth or um, uh, their pre-harvesting life cycle. Hopefully that helps. Awesome. Yeah, Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. For those that are following in the uh, the chat, you know, Marcel's not calling the right uh, inspector because she seems to be getting the other 25%. So, you know, Marcel, tell your guys to call the right number because Leighton's there to help you. Um, moving John, can along. I jump in real quick? Just Absolutely. On, on the yeah. The, so we actually just did an event today with Patrick Enright at the City of Vancouver talking about the embodied carbon policy. Um, so just a, a quick update on that front is that, yeah, the, the target is the 40% reduction by 2030. Um, and they're gonna start with the rezoning requirement. So currently in the rezoning requirement, a lot of the projects do need to do an LCA, not the past house ones, but uh, the other projects going down the other pathways, they, they, they need to do an LCA. Um, and it sounds like uh, in 2021, they're gonna be updating the rezoning requirement and they're gonna be requiring at least a 10% reduction on embodied carbon. Um, and I learned this uh, today. He said it was at least 10%, doesn't mean it is 10%. It could potentially be 15, could be 20. It could be differ between different archetypes. So they haven't finalized on the strategy, but what they're saying is that it's at least 10%. Um, and that'll likely come into effect end of 2021 or potentially early 2022. Um, so that's just a little tidbit. Uh, there's a lot more to the embodied carbon strategy in the climate emergency action plan, but um, yeah, that was just one little tidbit that I learned from today. And it was great to hear that you guys are doing um, incentivizing the builders for a climate action tool as well for low rise. I think that's pretty cool, so. And Anthony, just give yourself an intro for people that don't know you, you because you're amazing and, and you need, we need to know who you are. And where uh, we can follow you, Anthony, make sure I'd like to keep up and uh, <laughs> make sure you include that too, bud. Thanks, John. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I help organize the CLF Vancouver group. So it's Carbon Leadership Forum Vancouver group. And so we bring together all the relevant building stakeholders around uh, to tackle embodied carbon. And so we host a range of events relating to embodied carbon. Um, including the most recent one, uh, which was on the embodied carbon policy. And we also have, uh, for our previous events, we, we record the presentations and we put it onto our uh, CLF Vancouver YouTube channel. So if you're interested in hearing more about the embodied carbon policy, that video, video will likely be up probably after this weekend. Uh, um, so if you want to see Patrick's presentation on, on the policy, uh, that'll be up soon as well. But uh, yeah, nice to meet everyone. And yeah, in terms of my background, I, I do whole building life cycle assessment. So I model the embodied carbon for projects. He's fantastic. I, I give you huge credit because yeah, Anthony, your company name is. Oh yeah. Prior <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you got to give me props, Anthony, what you've done for the body carbon discussion in the last year is amazing. And, you know, you took your small group of 25 people up to like 120 within a year because people who are also interested in passive house are also in, in, interested in body carbon. And uh, it's great to see your organization grow and connect with us. So, God, again, God love the collaboration. Totally. Oh, I mean, I think we mirrored a lot of what we did with what, what we're seeing with Passive House, right? Like in the early days with the social, we were like, oh, we should do something for Embodied Carbon. And so there's a lot of kind of uh, flowing back and forth. But uh, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Uh, okay, coming back to questions. Uh, Susan, you have a couple or maybe one. If you remember, and, and how many uh, well, glasses I of remember, wine have you I had? wanted to know whether or not the hamster was European or golden. <laughs> that was not the question for Chris, but I won't. I won't ask that one. <laughs> the other one, Monty kind of answered it, but I can answer. I, yeah, he answered it in the chat. So thank you. Okay, um, you did have one more, like a couple of questions. Oh ago. yes, it was actually yeah, yeah. no Anthony, but then someone answered in the chat. It was Monty again. So <laughs> I can't ask questions. No, it's fine. We got like, there's like a whole Vancouver, uh, you know, question concierge here that's doing a great job making my life easy. So there's just some good, good answers. So it's great. Um, now, Adam had a question about uh, toppings. What kind of toppings do council members prefer? And if you were on last night's construction tech, you would realize it's Hawaiian because it's a Canadian 
um, pizza. So that's that answers it, Adam. Um, moving over to Ian. I think Ian, you were answering John's question, or Ian, did you have a a question? I was just answering John's thing. I think I was talking about the wood treatment and stuff like that. Um, no, I, I've asked Chris enough questions. I don't think I've, I, I have any more right now. Yeah, yeah, you get cut off tonight, Ian, because yeah, you've taken enough time of Chris. He's saying he's having an anti Ian night, so oh. it's totally fine. Um, no, I get, I mean, Ian pushes the boundaries and, and we'll dig in and, um, Ian has like the secret book of zoning for Vancouver. So he's like, Hey, what about this zoning, blah, blah, blah. And, and Chris is like, Oh, I forgot about that. Yes, that can apply. And yes, you can get an extra 0.12 FSR with your technical manipulation of the details. So yeah, that, that's, that's occurred. Um, every planner's nightmare not really chris's every other planners <laughs> yeah yeah i guess it's salem that doesn't like it uh trevor you said you didn't have a question but then you came back with one um are we going to skip you or i mean i was just looking for a link to the information about the bonus for case that oh. uh, providing case study info yeah that's right what i want to bring up uh again there was a bunch of questions about the, the FSR, um, can you just clarify, Chris, again, the multifamily versus the single family versus the townhouse or duplex? Sure, sure, yeah. If there's questions about the, the near zero program, we're very lucky Roberto is on the call um, and he, he works for the Zero Emissions Building Exchange and he can answer questions around uh, the near zero program. Near zero.ca is the website. But yeah, I'm happy to address questions on floor space. So there's 5% that's available for multifamily. And in addition to the 5% floor area bonus for multifamily, there's a number of other uh, incentives for multifamily that are available. We went through an exercise to simplify it for single family homes and combine all of the various incentives we had developed over a number of years. Uh, and so now that's where we get the 15% floor area bonus for single family and 18% for um, uh, for uh, duplex. Um, so the 15 and 18 stand alone. Those are the only incentives you get. Whereas with multifamily, we're still under the old structure where you get 5% flurry bonus plus a range of other incentives like a 2% flurry bonus if you use a passive house certified HRV that is factory commissioned, uh, commissioned by a factory authorized representative and a number of other incentives. Scott Kennedy who's on the call could, could talk about that with much more uh, eye for detail because he's, he's gone through and he's sold that to clients and he has projects that are using that incentive. I don't know, Scott, if you want to touch on that. I saw you on the call earlier. Scott, let's hold on to that to the uh, over to, or to the after hours and I'll, and I'll bring you back in, Scott, to talk about that because that's a, an important thing. Um, so if we're good there, we're going to go to Bronwyn. Hey there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. Chris, um, just for, you know, I love your presentation and I so admire all your fabulous work in Vancouver. Thank you so much. Um, for every other city in North America that needs to begin this journey, I wanted to ask, what was the hook? Where, where did you guys start? Why did Vancouver... Um, pick passive house when there are other green certifications out there and just to follow up on that um did you did you explore other certificate maybe that's probably not a diplomatic way to go but uh, maybe you know, you know tell us the the, the on-ramp because really we have to get our other cities onto this ramp yeah great question Bronwyn thank you so I mean Vancouver uh, had a third party um, measure and commission what we were getting, Vancouver, what Vancouver was getting out of the standards that we were referencing at the time. So at the time we were referencing a program called LEED, um, which was applied to commercial and residential buildings. And Vancouver builds mostly residential. We built some office and some uh, other commercial buildings, but we build a lot of residential. We're the densest city in Canada. Um, so there's a lot of high rise and mid rise um, residential and what we determined from that assessment was that we weren't actually getting a lot of the um, pieces that we desired as a city, the buildings that were being built weren't actually uh, lower in carbon. 
um, relative to what we would see in a sort of a code minimum outcome. So first, what we looked at was what wasn't working. So we looked at, well, what are we doing and what is our outcome? And when we determined that we're not actually making that much progress on climate change and on greenhouse gases with the current tools, okay, let's, let's look at what other tools are available. And we looked at both what other tools are available uh, and how well do they align with our goals. And when we determined our goal is a focused reduction on greenhouse gases, and we wanted to do it in an affordable way. So that led us to look at, well, let's look at standards that are envelope focused. Let's look at standards that are reducing the amount of energy used. Um, so yeah, we looked at the Living Future Institute's um, a, a certification and, and program, the Living Building Challenge, and we do reference that, and that is an option. Um, that projects can pursue if, if they if they prefer not to pursue Passive House. Uh, we did look at other programs. There's a program in Canada, no you know, disc to that program, but a program called Build Green. And um, we also sort of re-looked at LEED and a few others. And just in looking at them, the focus on envelopes and the, the educational um, offering that was available and how we thought it could sort of transform the Vancouver marketplace. Uh, Passive House just, it hit all of the right marks in terms of being able to help transform the supply chain, being envelope focused, um, being focused on reducing um, greenhouse gases and energy use for space heating, which was our sort of biggest greenhouse gas footprint piece. So yeah, to answer the question, we did look at other standards and this standard just aligned closely with uh, council's direction and it was also aligned with the goal that we were making the least progress on uh, if you look back a decade vancouver had a number of green building goals and we made progress on a number of them including water efficiency uh, including uh, reducing volatile organic compounds uh, in inside buildings like there was great progress on a number of fronts but on energy and greenhouse gases uh, we made some progress in low rise residential and in commercial and institutional and high rise, uh, we're treading water and, and slowly sinking. Um, so yeah, the, re the review of other standards led us to see that Passive House seemed to have the most chance of helping us um, achieve our goals. And then, so then we talked to a number of uh, industry practitioners that were using uh, Passive House and decided Passive House to the PHI standard, um, that's that, that's what we want to uh, follow. And we think that has the best chance of market transformation. And that's when we started removing barriers because council initially wasn't keen on us putting in place incentives. They didn't even want us to use the word incentives. Um, so we're just removing barriers. So as an example, one of the first barrier removal pieces for commercial buildings, uh, one of the earlier pieces was a 2% bonus in floor area if you use a Passive House certified HRV. So we're not giving an, a, a, an incentive, we're just giving you extra floor space to a, a accommodate a larger HRV um, and all the duct work that goes with it. Does that answer your question, Bronwyn? Absolutely, and I, I, I hope you can find a way to clone yourselves because we desperately need you everywhere. <laughs> Well, once we can travel again, we're we're happy to travel. We're also happy to, to share policy. Um, yeah, or or um, it, again, the sort of offer if like a counselor wants to talk to a counselor here, or the head of inspections wants to talk to the head of inspections there. Like that, that's that's definitely an option. Um, yeah, we're happy to share what we've done. Um, Thank you. It's been fabulous already, and uh, yeah, I just wish more people would actually. Uh take up those offers so <laughs> thanks sure. again keep keep You're moving welcome. forward it's awesome thanks yeah, great question Bronwyn and then there are some great um discussions in the chat that also helped out um which helps answer Chris's questions uh Monty off to you uh great <clears throat> I'll be brief and we can close out this section you know I I'm so grateful that you shared all this Chris it's really fantastic you know what I would just add to Bronwyn's point is that while the city of Vancouver is an absolute leader we couldn't have done it without them they were our part of this whole ecosystem. Uh, BCIT, our trade school, has been a fantastic partner through all of this. The province, which at the same historic time was open to this interesting political trade that led to the step code, was part of this. We had uh, companies like the company that invented the core that's in Zender HRV that were already here that were looking for markets. And to, to kind of double down on what Chris said, 
a whole lot of us had spent the last two decades building so-called green buildings that sucked. I think I met Chris about the time or shortly before I got into Passive House. Like we've known each other for a long time and lots of us worked through other programs we won't name right now. Mm -hmm. And we became aware of their problems, but we also gained experience. And so we really benefited from having lots and lots of lead APs in the market. Lots of people who had tried something else and were looking for something a little better around the same time. And we're willing to set aside some of our differences of approach in pursuit of something better. So there was the sense in which this place was ready for it. It was ripe for it. We'd been kind of doing green building badly for almost 20 years. And, and there were lots of people who, who knew that in lots of segments. And so I, my advice to every other city would be reach out in all directions. We need vendors, we need builders, we need tradespeople, we need unions, we need the city, both sides of the city, the people who do policy and the people who are out kicking buildings. Um, to, to focus only on political leaders is probably a massive strategic mistake. It's got to start broadly, I think. Anyway, thank you, Chris. It's great to see you virtually. Um, thanks for a fantastic presentation. Prudence? Thanks very much for having me. Hey guys, thanks so much, Chris. It's really great to hear everything that you guys are doing. I can say firsthand, Having gone to Vancouver from working all over the US and, and being in the environment that you guys created, it was one of the most exciting places I've ever had the opportunity to work and I really miss it. You guys are doing such great stuff. So thank you. Thank you. So are you guys ready to roll into the after hour? We are. Let's say Go, Zach. Hold on, hold on. Zach's got to say a few thank yous. Hold where, on, Jeff. So where in the world is Prudence? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Philadelphia right now, and Boston, Boston is calling. You move around more companies. than Corbin, San Diego. That's it. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, Zach. I swear I'm All right. Stay I'm, put. <laughs> so piggybacking on this idea that there are lots of players in this ecosystem that make all this happen. Um, the work that that uh, that we do with the happy hour and and the tech Tuesdays and our podcast and our website, none of that would be possible. It'd all be impossible without the support of our sponsors. So I really want to thank them uh, wholeheartedly and encourage everybody to support them. Our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US. RDH Building Science, StoCorp, and Zola Windows. Our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, and our patron sponsors are Inotech Windows and Doors, Morrison Hirschfield, and Partel. I want to say a couple of things about stuff that's coming down the pike here. On Monday, please, uh, please register for our Passive House Prefab Summit 2, number two. We'll, I'll, I'll share a link in chat. This is uh, going to be a great event. It's uh, moderated by Sean St. Amour, uh, uh, produced by Mary James of The Accelerator. It, this, this event will include six new manufacturers, uh, brand, brand new manufacturers, new storylines, um, lots of great visuals about the process. And our sponsors for this event are VaproShield and RDH Building Science. So uh, please join us. Um, next week, Construction Tech Tuesday will include a prefab all-star um, yet to be revealed, but we're excited. We're excited to reveal him when 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 we're ready. Um, and uh, we'll it's this is a follow up on on the summit that will ha be happening the the night before. And then on Wednesday, we our Global Passive House Happy Happy Hour will feature Dan Nall of Ashray Two Twenty Seven. So, Ashray, as many of you know, is an incredibly important organization um, that sells, sets standards and guides things like building code. Um, so, the fact that Ashray is creating and working on and creating a passive building standard. Um, is really big news in uh, in the U.S. and in North America, and um, includes a collaborative process with PHI and FIAS and other players um, that's being uh, herded and or orchestrated and um, harmonized uh, thanks to the work of Dan Nall. So this is a really interesting um, uh, process and potentially 
kind of uh, earth, earth moving in the US in terms of um, building policy. So please join us for that. Thank you.